Next on A Holy Calling, the start of a two-part series on the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Welcome to A Holy Calling, a teaching ministry of Don Minkler which focuses especially on the great doctrines of the faith, having a special focus and desire to encourage fellow ministers in their calling and to equip students of the Word in the great doctrines of the faith. I'm your host, Jim Minkler, who along with my brother Don Minkler, who is also my brother in the Lord, am thankful for this opportunity to present this ministry before you today. Today we begin a two-part series on the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. And Don, I'm looking forward to the series going forth because there's a real need for the proclamation of this doctrine, for it seems as if there's just not a lot of teaching heard on it. Perhaps that can be somewhat accounted for by the fact that there's just such a great acceptance of the doctrine among Christians, the doctrine of the Trinity being the historic teaching of the Church. But it certainly still needs to be proclaimed today, for the doctrine of the Holy Trinity is one that is both opposed and attacked by the cults. Oh, indeed, brother. It's universal acceptance, far from being a reason for it to be little spoken on. Instead, that underscores its importance in Christianity, where there are good and powerful reasons why the doctrine of the Trinity is so universally believed. For the truth contained in the doctrine of the Trinity cannot be separated from a right understanding of the divine Christ, the atonement, substitution, the power of the blood, and more. Acceptance of the doctrine of the Trinity is the acceptance of the biblical revelation that God has given of himself. Amen. Well, let's get right to the first half of this two-part series on the doctrine of the Trinity. But before we do so, brother, would you start us off with a word of prayer? Ah, gladly. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to bring forth your word. Would you bless this time in such a way as to open up hearts and minds to the truth, to the foundational teachings that you have revealed of yourself as the holy triune God who loves us and has made a way of salvation for us through the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. At the top of your notes, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I love the way the Trinity doctrine appears in the New Testament. It doesn't come to us in slow degrees, bit by bit, here a little, there a little, but rather just, bam, the doctrine is in, in front of us. Much the same way that God revealed himself in the Old Testament. God didn't come along and give us, first of all, 10 good reasons why we ought to believe there's a God and why we ought to believe he was the creator. He just simply started out, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the doctrine of the Trinity is revealed much the same way. We can't help but notice the doctrine of the Trinity throughout all the New Testament. And by the light of the New Testament, even when we look into the Old Testament, we see that it has always existed. Clearly, this verse reveals the Trinity. Notice that baptism into the Christian faith is a baptism into the Trinity. Clearly what's stated and implied in this verse of one is stated and implied of the others. We also notice that the Trinity here is revealed in the very language which is used. Notice that it says, baptizing them into the name singular, not plural, not into the names, plural, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but into the name. Three distinct persons, and yet, what a very distinct point is made to point out the unity, one name. Now, each of the persons is of absolute equality here in this statement because it would be absolutely monstrous to imagine baptism to be in the name of God and into a creature called Jesus and into an attribute called the Holy Spirit, as some cults would have us believe. Ridiculous. God would never share his glory with a creature, nor could an attribute of God be isolated and exalted at the expense of the other attributes of God. Each of these, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, must be persons and must be persons of absolute equality because whatever honor is given to one is given to each of the others into the name singular. Now on your notes there underneath, what do we mean by the divine trinity? We can't come up with any better words than what the church fathers have come up with. I, I love the expression of the church creed, the Athanasian creed. I'm not quoting the whole creed. I've given you actually a little more in your notes there that I'm reading. But in part it reads, We worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father and another of the Son 
and another of the Holy Spirit. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God only. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, not made nor created, but begotten. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. And in this trinity none is afore or after another, none is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal and co-equal, so that in all things, as aforesaid, the unity in trinity and the trinity in unity is to be worshipped. Amen. I love what A.W. Tozer said. He, he said something to the effect of, that's like a chicken dinner to his soul to hear that. How beautifully and reverently that expresses the revelation of Scripture, harmonizing the truths revealed in Scripture without any attempt to go beyond what's being revealed, accepting the revelation that God has given of himself. Clearly, the doctrine of the Trinity is abundantly testified, as we're going to see as we go through this, in a numerous amount of ways. Now, clearly, it's not difficult to recognize the existence of the doctrine of the Trinity in the Word of God. That's not the difficult part. The difficult part is who can explain three persons, and yet there is no other but one God. I love what A.W. Tozer said. The fact that it cannot be satisfactorily explained, instead of being against it, is in its favor. Such a truth had to be revealed. No one could have imagined it. Though the doctrine of the Trinity is beyond our ability to fully comprehend, there is nothing in it, though, that is contradictory to reason, and it proves itself to be very necessary to our right understanding of Christianity. It is fundamental to the faith. If there is no Trinity, then there is no God-man who bridged the gap for our salvation. And then there's no Holy Spirit who was sent by him to convict the world of sin and to indwell the believer so that he makes him a partaker of the atonement, which is provided by the Father, that the Spirit of the Son might come into our hearts that we might be reconciled to God and call out, Abba, Father. Indeed, this is unspeakable mystery, this unison and how the three work together. And as history has shown, a denial of the Trinity leads to an abundance of heresies against plainly revealed truth especially regarding the person of Jesus Christ and the person of the Holy Spirit and atonement and salvation. Again, if there is no Trinity, there is no divine Christ. There is no atonement for sin then because sin is an infinite offense before God and it needs an infinite sacrifice. But if Jesus is just a creature, a creation, then he is not infinite and he cannot remove the infinite offense that sin is. As well, that means then there is no substitution. There is no salvation by grace then, and men are left only to develop a religious concept of salvation like the many heathen religions that are out there already. In fact, the denial of the Trinity is such that it begins a dismal descent that ultimately leads away from a system that is no longer the Christian faith at all. Now in your notes underneath the unity of the Trinity, we're going to begin to look at some of the elementary points of the doctrine of the Trinity. And one of the elementary points of the doctrine of the Trinity is the unity of God, that there is but one God. In your notes there, you'll see I put down a few scriptures. These are just samples of many more we could bring. But Deuteronomy 4.35 tells us, To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself is God. There is none other besides him. And of course, we're all familiar with Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Likewise, in the New Testament, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus said, No one is good but one, that is God. In John 5, 44, Jesus said, To seek that honor that comes from the only God. Mark 12, 29, you recall Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And the scribe he's speaking to says, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no other but he. Paul proclaims this, 2 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God, and we're all familiar with James 2.19. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. There is absolute unity on this. The church has never denied this, that there is but one true God. Now we can multiply many others, but just as easily as we can multiply text to reveal the unity of the Trinity, we could easily multiply text to reveal the plurality of three in unity. Now this time if you look in your notes under the Trinity in unity, 
you'll see we have some scriptures showing the plurality. We'll start again here with Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Likewise, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, a very familiar passage as well. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Now clearly, three persons are referred to in this. It takes a person to show grace, it takes a person to show love, and it takes a person to have communion, to have fellowship with. Every time this benediction is used, it's a confession of the Trinity. Also, you recall, of course, the Lord's baptism. Jesus was there, the Holy Spirit was there, came down in the form of a dove, and from heaven the Father spoke and said, This is my beloved Son. Clearly, the three distinctly represented there. One of my favorite passages is Hebrews 9.14. This teaches... Uh, so plainly that the Trinity is being represented here in the work of redemption. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Amen. Ephesians 2.18, For through him, that is Jesus, we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. 1 Peter 1.2, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. We could multiply many more. In fact, if you look there, there in your notes, I've got more than 20 more listed you can look up that refer to the three distinctly. However, I only want to give one more here. I want to refer to what I believe is the most precious passage, the most precious and beautiful passage spoken upon the Trinity, and that's John chapters 14 through 16. Judas is already out gathering a mob. He's coming to, uh, to have Jesus arrested as he betrays him. And Jesus speaks most beautifully about this, this interchange of the Trinity. It's incredible. John chapter 14, verse 15 there in your notes. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Now that is incredible. What a passage. Jesus says, I will not leave you orphans, but I will come to you. How? He says he will send the person of the Holy Spirit from the Father. John 14, 23 through 26. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Now, this is incredible. Ponder this. He speaks saying that I and the Father will make our home with you. How? He proceeds to say that the Helper, the Holy Spirit, would come to them. John 15, 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you. He just said the Father would send him. Now he says, whom I send to you. Whom I shall send to you from the Father. The Spirit of truth proceeds from the Father. He will testify of me. And I've got another passage there. I'm, not, I'm just going to skip it for the sake of time, but just skip down to the last one there, verse 15. Jesus said, All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine, the Holy Spirit will take of mine, and declare it to you. Incredible. What incredible, awesome language this is revealing the Trinity. This beautiful interchange. Clearly the Trinity is revealed here, or we have no intelligent way at all to look upon him. And yet, we've just been looking at basic elements of the doctrine of the Trinity. We've not at all looked at the strongest proofs of the doctrine of the Trinity. These are yet to come, and they center around the person of Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to look at some powerful proofs of the doctrine of the Trinity in the fact that Scripture ascribes the attributes, titles, and the works that can belong only to the one true God to each of the three. And we're going to start in the section there in your notes the Father is God. Now we see plainly in the scriptures that each of the three are clearly revealed as God. And we're going to start with the Father. 
And there's no need for us to give an abundance of proofs that the Father is God. I know of no heresy against this. But nonetheless, let's look at a few texts which reveal this, this very basic thing. The Father is clearly called God. In your notes, John 6, 27, God the Father has set his seal on him. Jude 1 reads, Sanctified by God the Father. 1 Peter 1, 1, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Ephesians 4, 6, One God and Father of all. And of course, we could multiply many proofs along these lines, but they're not needed. It's not disputed. Clearly, the Scripture refers to the Father as God. However, what is greatly disputed and coming from the cults and the enemies of the faith, is that the Lord Jesus Christ, they say, is not truly God. Now here we're going to spend a little more time. Clearly the scriptures abundantly testify to the fact that the Son is fully God, equal to the Father in numerous texts and in numerous ways, declaring that He is the one true God. Look in your notes now under the Son is God. We begin with John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What better wording could human tongue ever come up with to reveal the Trinity? The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14, I love that. And the Word became flesh, one of us, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. John 20, 28. Thomas falls down before Jesus, and he declares, My Lord and my God. This was, of course, no profane taking of God's name in vain by an apostle. Not at all. This was a declaration of Christ as being God, my Lord and my God. 1 Timothy 3.16, Paul says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. Who was manifested in the flesh? God. And we quote at Christmas time all the time, Isaiah 9.6, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Also Acts 20, 28, Paul is telling the Ephesian elders to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Notice, God's church was purchased with his own blood, with the blood of God. Romans 9, 5, Paul says, Of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Titus 2, 13, Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, in Isaiah, we read, uh, God says in verse 43, 11, Yahweh, I, even I, am the Lord. And besides me, there is no Savior. And a similar thing is said also in, in uh, Hosea 13, 4. Indeed, there is no Savior but Yahweh. Yahweh says this. And we also read in this very book of Titus, interchange God our Savior and Christ Jesus our Lord as Savior. And here Paul puts them both together in Titus 2, 13 and says, looking for the, the, uh, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter also uses this, saying, To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1, 6-10, again, powerful, referencing the Old Testament. Jesus is plainly declared to be Yahweh or Jehovah, as some seek to pronounce the unpronounceable name. Verse 6 reads, But when he again brings the firstborn into the world... He says, let all the angels of God worship him. Wow, that's powerful. Let's just stop right there for a moment. Let all the angels of God worship him, worship Jesus. You recall that John fell in the Revelation down before the feet of the angel who showed him these things, and the angel said, get up, worship God only. And of course, all the host of heaven falls down and worships the lamb that was slain. Here we read, let all the angels of God worship him. An angel is only allowed, just like man, to worship none other than God. But going on, verse 7. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God... Your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Powerful. 
And then verse 10, we have a plain declaration that Jesus is Yahweh. And you, Lord, capitalize L-O-R-D in the New King James, and rightly so, because it's referencing a quote in the Old Testament where the name Yahweh is used. And being used in the Old Testament applied to Yahweh, and in the New Testament is said this was spoken to the Son. Powerful. You, Yahweh, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Jesus is the one who created all, who said, let there be light. Yahweh, in the beginning, he laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of his hands. Colossians 2, 9, powerful. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You recall how in uh, John chapter 10, verse uh, 33, the Jews answered saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. Now the cults may not understand the language of Scripture. They may not understand what the Word of God is teaching, but but the Jews certainly did. They understood that he declared himself to be God. Now, of course, they're going to answer and say, well, that was just the enemies of Jesus saying that he made the claim to be God and not Jesus making it. But all we have to do is look over at John chapter 5 in which... This time, it is the word of God itself giving commentary that this is what Jesus said, as John tells us this was Jesus' meaning. John chapter 5, verse 18 says, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, this is John saying this, this is not the enemy saying this, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. It is not robbery to say that Jesus is equal to God. It doesn't hurt God at all. It doesn't rob him at all. Philippians 2, 6, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. And there are a multitude of ways in which Jesus Christ is referred to as God. His very name from Isaiah 7, 14 and Matthew 1, 23 in prophecy. Emmanuel, translated, what does it mean? God with us. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. He is expressly referred to as Yahweh. Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6. His name by which he is to be called, it says, is Yahweh, or Jehovah, our righteousness. Also Isaiah 40, verse 3, and compare that also with Malachi 3, 1, and Mark 1, 1 through 3. This is clearly referred to as Yahweh here. This was of John the Baptist in the wilderness. He was preparing the way for who? Prepare the way for Yahweh. And of course, he prepared the way for the Lord Jesus. Hebrews 1.10, we've already looked at that. It's addressed to the Son and it says, You, Yahweh, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth. Also by the title, the first and the last, this is applied to Yahweh and it's applied to Jesus interchangeably. Isaiah 41, 4, 44, 6, 48, 12, Revelation 22, 13, 21, 6 in your notes. Compare those and clearly Jesus, Yahweh, is referred to as the first and the last. Also, Christ is plainly revealed to be God in the fact that the attributes that can belong to God alone are said to be His. God alone is true, eternal, infinite, immutable. John 5, or I'm sorry, 8, 58, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Micah 5, 2, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting, from days of eternity, can be translated. Isaiah 9, 6, he is called the everlasting father. Hebrews 13, 8, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Likewise, by the definition of the word omnipotent, Only one, only one can be omnipotent. There cannot be two having all powers because then one doesn't have all powers. They must be one and the same to have all power and Christ is referred to as omnipotent. I see that our time is going quickly and I'm going to have to do this very, very fast. But uh, Jesus is declared to be the omnipotent one. Hebrews 1.3 says that he holds all things by the word of his power. Romans 9.5, Revelation 1.8 and 22.13, they reveal that he is the Almighty. 1 Timothy 6.15, he who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Colossians 1.17, he is before all things and in him all things consist. Philippians 2.21, he is able to subdue all things to himself. And I love this one. Colossians 2.10, 
He is the head of all principality and power. All principality and all power. He who humbled himself has all power and all authority. Again, Jesus is revealed by another attribute that can only belong to God, that of being omnipresent everywhere at once. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, that the fullness of him who fills all in all. He spoke to Nicodemus in John 3, that no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. He, while being on earth, speaking to Nicodemus, he said, who is in heaven as well. Uh, Matthew 28, 20, lo, I am with you always. Matthew 18, 20, and where two or three are gathered together, there he is in the midst of them. And there's no limit to the number of people that Christ can dwell in their hearts. Paul said that Christ lives in me and in everyone who has faith in him. Clearly, he is revealed to be omnipresent, an attribute of God alone. Again, another attribute, he is omniscient, all-knowing. John 21, 17 declares that he knows all things. John 16, 30 knows all things and has no need that anyone question him. Colossians 2, 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All knowledge is in Christ. He knew Nathaniel under the fig tree. He knew all men, knows their thoughts. Also by the fact that he is the judge of all things. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, that we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And Hebrews 4.13 tells us that there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Only he who has all power, who is everywhere at once, who knows all things, could preside as judge on the final day of complete accounting. Jesus is clearly declared to be omniscient. As he is declared in Romans 9.5, he is the eternally blessed God over all. Amen. And it is not robbery to say he is equal to God. Now, I've got to go at a breakneck speed here. If you look under your section under the Holy Spirit is God, we'll just briefly look at some things. It's not really disputed. That's not where the heresy lies, whether or not he's God or not. Uh, the heresy lies whether or not he's really a person. But let's, let's start where we started with the others, that the Holy Spirit is God. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17 says, Do you not know that you're the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Why are we the temple of God? Because God's Spirit is in us. Acts 5, 3 through 4, uh, Peter said, Why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to men, but to God. To lie to the Holy Spirit is to lie to God. Acts 13, we see that as God, he answers prayer. 2 Peter 1, 20, that he wrote the word of God. That's a great proof of being God. He wrote the word of God. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, and Hebrews 10, 15, looking at those, he's declared to be Yahweh. Likewise, like the Father, he is declared to be eternal, the eternal spirit in Hebrews 9, 14. He's omnipotent. Luke 1, 35, we know that one at Christmas time. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Also, he's omnipresent. Psalm 139, we're so familiar with that, where David says, where can I flee from your presence? It's impossible. I can't flee from the Spirit. That he's omniscient. John 16, 13, that the Holy Spirit guides into all truth. In 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11, we're told that the Spirit searches all things, yes, even the deep things of God. And no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Clearly, he's declared to be the Almighty. The cults don't really attack for the most part that he is God. They don't leave that alone. They just simply say he's not a person. Of course he is. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, that we have fellowship with the Spirit. You don't have fellowship with a mere power, a force of wind. It takes a person to have fellowship. Acts 8, 29, that he commands. 1 Corinthians 2, 10, that he has intelligence. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, he works as he wills. He has a will, he is a person. Acts 13, by his will, he decides, he directs, he separates, and he sends to work. Hebrews 10, 29, that he can be insulted. You can't insult a power like electricity. It takes a person to be insulted. Romans 8, 26, he intercedes and he prays. John 14, 26, he teaches. Romans 8, 14, and John 16, 13, he leads and he guides. Ephesians 4, 30, while wow, this is powerful proof of his being a person, he can be grieved. It takes a person to be able to have a broken heart. John 16, 8, he convicts. John 15, 26, he testifies. Acts 9, 31, he comforts. The Holy Spirit indeed is a person. Indeed, the three are God. Each one individually declared to have the attributes that belong only to the one true God individually. Clearly, we baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Amen. How awesome is our God. And how powerful and convincing is the revelation of himself as a triune God, the blessed Trinity in unity. Truly the height, depth, width, and breadth of the doctrine of the Trinity, while beyond our experience and beyond our powers to fully grasp, is nonetheless something that we cannot help but believe in. For God has abundantly, powerfully, and so plainly revealed himself to us through the scriptures. Oh, I love the way you worded that, brother. Beyond our experience, yet so plainly revealed that we cannot help but believe it. God alone is the self-existing one, the I am, the creator of all else, being before all things and in whom all things consist. God then is truly transcendent above all of our highest, all of our best, our most noble thoughts of him. No one can either deceive God nor flatter God. He is the great I am. I love something that A.W. Tozer pointed out in his book, Christ the Eternal Son, and though I don't have the exact wording with me right now, Tozer pointed out the truth that all things can be reduced either to God and that which is not God, either God or not God. That's so beautifully said. There's either that which is God, who is the infinite, eternal, immutable, unsearchable, limitless, uncreated God, and then everything else which exists being that which God has created, whether it be created things in heaven or on earth, visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, he alone is the self-existing God who is before all things and in whom all things consist. Well, this reveals then that the expanse between God and not God is beyond our human creature comprehension to fully fathom. And it means then that as creatures, we are definitely limited then with our powers to conceive and speak of the greatness of the uncreated God. Amen. Well, Don, for those listening to the message you gave today, I can just picture someone getting all excited about the things shared and then frantically trying to write down all the scripture references you gave. Which could be a bad thing if they're driving. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> well, to avoid a major catastrophe from happening, then I'm going to tell our listeners how they can get their own copy of the notes to this lesson. And that way they can have all the references handy. Simply go to our website at www.aholycalling.com, click on Trinity, and there you can print off the notes in PDF form. Well, Don, talking about what Scripture reveals concerning the transcendent majesty of God, when we come to the place where we see that God is beyond our highest powers to comprehend, rather than it being a hindrance to faith, hearing the Word of God excites the believer's faith, for faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Oh, so true, Jim. I like a little quote I found that's attributed to Gerard Turstingen, who said, A God comprehended is no God. We should expect the doctrine of the Trinity, which considers the revelation that God has given of himself in Scripture, we should expect it to be beyond our creature powers to fully grasp. Well, certainly one aspect which comes into focus when we're considering the transcendent majesty of God is how reverently we should think of and speak about God. Amen. As you know, brother, I couldn't agree with you more. It's troubling how carelessly and even coldly people can be found to speak about God in terms and manners that are unworthy of Him. And Jim, like you, I'm extremely grateful for the upbringing we had, starting with our godly parents, but as well our godly grandparents, uncles and aunts. And I think especially of our uncle and aunt, of whom he was our pastor and, and she was my Sunday school teacher who were so helpful in teaching me the fear of God so that I learned to speak and refer to God only in the most reverent manner. And in fact, I plainly remember when I was a young child, our older brother Steve, in fact, I'm not even sure if you were around or not then, Jim, but as they say, you were no more perhaps than just a twinkle in mom and dad's eye, but, <laughs> but I remember our older brother Steve turning off something that I was watching on TV and explaining to me why it was slanderous talk against God. And it opened up my eyes that day, and I've been grateful for that moment and that lesson. For we must both speak and think only in the deepest of reverence concerning the person of God, for He is so far above our best and our highest thoughts. Don, I love that word you used, transcendent. For it is such a great word to use when considering God himself and the doctrine of the Trinity, transcendent meaning, of course, that which transcends, that which is beyond our human experience, that which is not limited to but exists apart from the limitations of that which is created. Certainly the doctrine of the Trinity is such a doctrine. It is a great word, and it's a word I'm especially grateful to A.W. Tozer for. He did a message once on the transcendence of God, and in his gifted way, Tozer sought to turn attention to how indescribably awesome the Lord God is. In fact, along with my upbringing, I'm also very grateful for the writings of A.W. Tozer, who died the year I was born. 1882, wasn't it? <laughs> Watch it, little brother. <laughs> 
but whose life and ministry really blessed me in considering the incomprehensible and transcendent God. In fact, what I have to say here next, I've got to say, I can't claim any originality for it, but rather I know at least much of it has come to me through Tozer opening up my mind. In fact, quite possibly through the writings of many others as well who I can't trace out, but I can definitely mention Tozer here. But consider how even the common expression heard in church, how we have a big God. Now, strictly speaking, that language is unworthy of God. And I'm sure that many who say that phrase do so with an acceptable reverent spirit. But follow me in this. Our God is not just a big God. For big is one of those creature words. Big is one of those words we use unthinkingly concerning the Lord. For big is a word of comparison to something else. A word for creature comparison for size and measurement. That is, the word big is always comparable to something else. It indicates measurement. For example, a mountain to a molehill. It indicates measurement. However, God is without measure. For to whom shall we liken God? As God said in Isaiah 46, 5, To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we should be alike? Amen. The difference between God and not God is so great that our minds are incapable of conceiving such that big just won't do. For example, we can't say that God is 50 billion times bigger than an archangel for rather than rightly exalting God in that kind of language... That puts a limit on God. For then, of course, all we'd have to do is just know the limits of a created archangel, do a little math, and then we'd have the size of God. But God is instead infinitely beyond an archangel. He is transcendent indeed. Now, though this may blow our minds to try and consider it, God is so indescribably awesome, so transcendent, that an archangel in heaven is no closer to being God than a slimy worm is in some dark cave somewhere for the reason that both the archangel and the worm are created. And the mere size and beauty of a creation doesn't qualify to be compared with God, for there is either God or not God, infinite God or that which is not infinite God, but what God has made. For there's certainly no imaginary evolutionary chart that we could put created things in some sort of an ascending order which would ever put us closer to being a calculable, comparable place to understanding the limits of the limitless God. Amen. All such an order of created things and the glory that attends them may do at best is to reveal a little bit more of the greatness, the transcendence of God, but they never get us to a point where we can say, now we can make a measurement of God from them. For God is truly transcendent. For God cannot be measured in astronomical height, nor measure of fathoms of depth, nor vanishing point to vanishing point of human understanding, of length, of breadth. Let us approach Him then only with worship. Or to look at it another way, if we should invent a spaceship that could go 50 billion times faster than the speed of light and travel in one direction for 50 billion years at that speed, at the end of our journey, we would be no closer nor farther away from the infinite, limitless, measureless God than we were when we began. Or go back in our minds to a time before there was any America, before there was any Europe, before there were any trees, before there was any planet Earth, or before there were angels and seraphim, before there was any created thing, visible or invisible, and there would still be the immutable, the measureless, the infinite, the transcendent Lord God, the I Am who is the blessed trinity in unity of whom we dare to speak today. It's only reasonable then that the doctrine of the Holy Trinity should be so far beyond our powers to fully grasp that we simply accept God's testimony of it, of which, as we've seen, and Lord willing shall consider more in next week's lesson, is abundantly revealed in Scripture. Amen. What you said, Don, brings to mind where Paul spoke about the love of Christ, about knowing and comprehending that which passes knowledge. As Paul went on to say that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we might ask or think. Exceedingly abundantly above. Those are words that reveal his glory is transcendent again. And I love Paul's words concerning the incarnation. Words which again reveal the transcendent glory of God, where he said, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. Amen. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Amen, brother. I love that precious scripture also. The incredible mystery of godliness, so that the indescribable gap between creator and creature was bridged by Christ, the mediator between God and man, as God became flesh fully man, without compromising his deity, being also fully God. Great is the mystery of godliness indeed. 
It's foolish religions of men that want to imagine a way where man can become God. Of course, all such religions have a very low understanding of God. God is not transcendent then. Or it's foolishness for someone to think that he could reach God, the transcendent God. However, the glory of the transcendent God includes the wondrous truth that God can become man and win us back to himself and included in the transcendent glory of God is the truth that he is trinity in unity. Wow, let us come then and worship and adore him. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for this week. So with that said, let me encourage our listeners to be sure to tune in to next week's broadcast for the conclusion of this two-part series on the doctrine of the Trinity. And if you happen to miss that, you can catch it online at www.aholycalling.com. And also let me mention that at the website you'll find other lessons that have been archived, as well as printable notes that go along with the ones which are doctrinal lessons. And if you'd like to receive a copy of this two-part series, you can do so by going and downloading it yourself from our website at, again, www.aholycalling.com. Or you can write to us at A Holy Calling, 880 Seaber Drive, Bandon, Oregon, 97411. And that address is found at our website as well. As long as we are able to, we desire to get these materials out to you free of charge. However, if you could include a donation to help with the cost of shipping and handling, or perhaps give to support the ministry of A Holy Calling, that would be greatly appreciated. Well, until next time, I'm your host, Jim Minkler. For Don Minkler and A Holy Calling Ministry, I remind you to keep looking to Him who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began.